Everybody, welcome to Soul Radio Live. Um, Soul Rad is a is it the online literary magazine for comics and is published by Field Mouse Press, the uh, publishing house which I am in charge of. I'm happy today to bring you an audio version of a deep dive into a very beautiful and exciting new book from Joel Pretty. First, there was chaos coming out from Uncivilized. It's here at the show today. Um, Joel, would you mind uh, showing off the, the hard copy to our lovely uh, participants here? We've got uh, two preview copies of the book, the actual printing of the book having been eaten by a typhoon, but will apparently be recovered by the end of the month. Um, lovely to see full hardcover. And I, the, the point I really want to show off with yeah, this show, book show. is, uh, you know, standard pages, uh, but at the end, there's a particular sort of climatic moment which uh, the uncivilized press was willing to produce as a fold-out, double-sided fold-out to really sort of give it that, that sort of extra format impact there, which I'm absolutely enchanted by and will show off at every opportunity. In addition to me on the panel today, we also have Thomas Campbell down at the bottom, or down at the base of our panel here with the beautiful Inez Estrada hat. Um, you, can't, you can't go to SPX without one, I don't think. And Rob Clow, the uh, critic, um, emer not emeritus, but a critic uh, extraordinaire, um, doing this now for multiple decades. Um, high, high, low, TCJ, Soul Rad, anywhere you can shake a stick at. Pretty much a bunch of others. <laughs> I, 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 I miss Study Group Magazine. I liked writing. That was a that was a thing, wasn't it? Wasn't yeah, it, it was. Well, thank you all so much for coming, and we're excited to talk to Joel today about uh, his work. Um, and this is the cover of the book. Um, it's although it's, I would say that the the final copy and the the colors look beautiful. Um, Joel. Just for the audience, I wanted to start with talking about um, what your what, what your kind of goals were with this story, because basically, for everyone who hasn't seen the work yet, we're uh, Joel's working through the the Greek creation myth, essentially. Uh, so I wanted to just start there. So what's your what was the what was the impetus for creating this book? Yeah, uh, the. The book came to me it pretty much in its entirety in just uh, like a five second flash. I was, I was reading Greek mythology to my kid at one night for a bedtime story and uh, uh, you know I wasn't reading like say one of the kids books, I was reading a textbook on Greek mythology to my kid. <laughs> there was this passage of, of Hesiod, the very sort of primal creation which is you know, just so much weirder and unformed than sort of the typical like stories of the twelve Olympiads, which I, I've always loved. Um, you know, going back to reading uh, the Marriage of Cadmus and Harmony. Uh, you know, where where I was absolutely enchanted by by uh, was it Robert Calypso or who wrote that? Who his his descriptions mm. of sort of these primal forms of eros and and uh, you know. Uh, creation coming out of an egg, which you know really sort of you know connects to like you know Vedic creation myths right. and so on. And um, so I was I was really enjoying this this little dip into Hesiod, and it connected to this point that I make in my in my day job as a uh, professor of graphic design with my students about how the process of creativity and creative ideation works and sort of um, embracing imperfections and working in cycles, iterations of, of development to, to arrive at something that is complete, but not trying to leap directly towards, you know, sort of a, a complete creation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that just that connection of, ooh, 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 here's the thing I really love. It connects to a thing I'm talking about all the time. And then I felt like that was a framework in which I could sort of do the kind of uh, narrative and visual little meanderings that are the only way I know how to make a graphic novel. Like, I, I can't really, I couldn't, well, I can script a graphic novel, but I can't then draw that graphic novel. Like, I, I just have to find things and pursue them in, in the process of it. And so 
having a framework I could work with there. It's like, yeah, that, that seems like a book. Yeah, that could be a book to me. Yeah. So then many years of sort of fumbling and wrong turns and, and so on until I came up with something that I think, yeah, no, that's more or less what I meant it to be. Yeah. I think you bring up kind of an Im improvisational kind of aspect to, to creation. Could you talk a little bit about that? I think there's, to a certain degree, there's some of that kind of tossed into Hesiod here as kind of the artist or maybe even your stand-in. We could talk a little bit about that. But mm -hmm. as the creator who's like struggling to come up with something that's going to be uh, worthwhile, both from a fame and glory perspective, but also, you know, make a living by, you know. Right. Yeah. So the, uh, yeah, I, I think that there, well, there are times where I think you can be extremely um, formal and, and um, you know, sort of rigid about the process of creation. But for something as, as big and time consuming and, and inefficient a way of telling a story as a graphic novel, I don't think I could. I would ever be able to maintain the energy and the focus over, you know, a couple of years, if I script, you know, scripted a thing and then thumbnailed the script and then inked the thumbnails and and so on. It just uh, um, that would be months and months of feeling like of of activity that is removed from where I was actually making creative decisions, mm -hmm. right? Um, so. You know, I, I can script a short story, but for a long thing, I, I've, I've got to just be making it up, making creative decisions every day or at least every week in order to feel connected to it. Um, the, you know, the, the, the sort of the, 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 the breakdown, the, the, the re reduction ad absurdum of the, uh, of the book is that, you know, you kind of have to embrace the beautiful monsters that, that you come up with, the, the imperfections that mm. come up to sort of finally arrive at a, at a complete thing. Um, yeah, so this uh, is an image of, of nothingness before the act of creativity has even occurred, the, the notion of of nothingness, not knowing what something it might want to be, that that transition from, you know, the the the, the Jungian concept of like the the transition of the unrealized whole to the realized something, the mm. fragment, and you have to lose the infinite potential mm, right. to become something, but you can't become something until you lose, you shut right. away a lot of that potential. So, so this is a moment of nothingness just coming coming to the realization that it could be things. Mm -hmm. As soon as you said Jungian, uh, Rob sat up in his chair. So I'm <laughs> interested to, to hear your thoughts about this. Um, well, it's actually interested in two particular points. Um, as, I've, as I told you, I've been following your work for a long time. Back 20 years ago, Joel did a book called Pulpitoon Pilgrimage which won uh, the uh, debut uh, Ignatz Award. Um, uh, a dubious award, but a, good, a great book. I, I see nothing dubious about it. I think it is the finest. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, it's literally awards for books that no one has read that debut at the show and that people, you know, they voted it like, oh, this, this seems, we like this person. So it was a vote for like how well liked you were, but the book itself is brilliant um, and involves a really like um, uh, intensive pen and ink drawing style. And then later, you did these short strips. I believe the character was a uh, Onion Jack, <laughs> that were like sketchier, playful, and that seems to resemble what you did here. So I'm I'm curious about you know kind of the the gap of years, which I know was like partly due to like work and career in academia, but I'm wondering like, you know, uh, what you said you this, this idea came to you in a flash. After all these years, besides this flash of an idea, what made you want to do this in a way that nothing else had drawn your attention all those years, and then why this particular style? Yeah, so uh, it's been, I, I, I put out graphic novels at a blistering pace of one a decade, 
Um, <laughs> you know, because I don't want to oversaturate the market. Um, I, I did a lot of other work, you know, in between. And I did, I did for a while there, I was producing uh, comics for um, history textbooks. Uh, this happened after um, the second uh, W. Bush election. And my response to that was like, well, if people knew more history, they wouldn't make mistakes like this. And, well, <laughs> history has proven me no, very are. wrong on that point. Um, if you'd read more history, you'd have known that it was futile yeah, in the first place. Yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> um, and that was, I was making very sort of realistically drawn, um, very ink intensive uh, comics for that uh, to, you know, sort of make it grounded in history, which meant I, I didn't have time to do that for any other side projects I was working on. So I, mm. I did sort of adopt this very um, almost ideographic sort of stick figure style um, where I could, I could tell, a, I could create a page from, from nothing to complete in an hour. And uh, the, the, um, the one, you know, literally one of the comics came out of that where I had a four page history comic to do over a weekend. I was sweating if I could pull that off. And I'd forgotten I had an eight-page story due to, to Ad House Books. So I was like, oh, okay. I can make an eight-hour break, and I can, I can if I, mm. And that, that was the amazing life of uh, Onion Jack. It's been my most widely printed story. It's it so is. playful and funny, and there's a freeness to it. And I feel that in this book, like every oh, single page. No matter, like, you switch styles, in, as we show in this, we see in the slides, there's like three different kinds of styles. There's like the gods, then we have the poet, um, and this kind of more portrait told story, um, and uh, the use of color, you know, it's like one or just one or two colors. And then, you know, the summarized things, when you have those little clouds that are like little maps. Mm -hmm. And I, I just love the, the diversity stuff, but all three of them are like very sketchy, playful, loose, almost like you embrace the chaos in your drawing yeah. style in this book. Is that a deliberate decision? Yeah, it was, it was a... It, well, specifically, it was part of a larger desire to bring together these different approaches that I had, right? I didn't, I wanted to, I, I felt like I had accomplished something in cranking an eight-page story out in eight hours that uh, I hadn't accomplished in the four-page story that I spent, like, you know, 48 hours working on, right? <laughs> um, uh, both in terms of sort of the, the playfulness, the visual playfulness that the, that style allowed me to engage in, but also the, the sort of the unconsciousness of the story. I think that it is, there's, there's a liveliness and a humor to that that I don't think you'd find in a lot of my other work. Um, simply because I didn't have time to think about anything, yeah. anything else. So I, I, but I didn't want to just be a stick figure guy, right? I want to, right. I want, I like to draw. I want to really sort of draw the hell out of a page. And, and uh, there certainly, I think it's very helpful in storytelling to sometimes, if I don't know how to get myself out of a corner narratively, I know how to get myself out of it pictorially. Mm. Like I can, I can, I could draw a solution to this. Uh, so I wanted to be able to, I guess really what it is, I wanted to be able to use all the tools in my toolbox, right? Mm. I didn't want to separate them out. And I can be very linear about things, like this is in this camp and this is in that camp. And I was try wanted to sort of work against that, that impulse and, and put it all in. So uh, an earlier draft of this, the stories of the poet were much more explicitly, the poet was more explicitly the figure of Hesiod. And they were drawn in a much more, you know, sort of standard narrative, cartoony style with, you know, fully realized backgrounds. And there was a whole rivalry with, with Homer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was, it was much more of its own story. And I, I really, I, I drew a lot of pages for it. It was, it was practically a book on itself. And I realized it was absolutely wrong for this. It was competing with the myth and... And if I wasn't going to dedicate myself to really like telling a story about a Greek poet, 
you know, it, it just it was it wasn't right. So I pared it down. I pared it down to to these these much more ideographic figures and these tiny little snippets and this very uh, almost um, you know paper theater kind of background mm -hmm. uh, to it. Um, which you know, I, I I miss all of the <laughs> all of the storytelling I did that is now just you know in a, uh, uh, a file in my in my studio. But this is such a better fit for sort of mm -hmm. the flow of the story I wanted to tell. Fascinating, fascinating, Thomas. I wanted to jump over to you since we haven't had a chance to hear from you yet. I I, I am interested in your th you know as a, uh, a very prolific cartoon uh, or comics uh, reviewer and and uh, I won't say thought leader, but a person who, because that sounds pretentious, but a person that really thinks deeply about comics and cares about them. I'm interested in your take on, on the way that Joel is kind of flipping between these various, uh, various tools, if you will, um, in the telling of this story. Um, yeah, I think it's really effective. Um, I think that, yeah, the choice to present Hesiod in this way then when we're switching to like Guy and Uranus, we're in the we're in his mind space. We're in the creative process along with him. I think one quibble I did have with the book was the that beginning sequence that we saw. I wanted it to read more chaotic. Um, like it looked too orderly. I mean, it's words in English in word bubbles like. I think of later the images of like the the hundred handers that that mm -hmm. looks chaotic to me mm -hmm. that that reads as that kind of like um, the energy. Yeah. So okay, I can address this. Uh, th this is this <laughs> is one of those uh, let's dive into the weeds of Greek mythology. Let's do. Yeah, let's do. Where there's there's sort of two contrary ver depictions of chaos that depending on sort of where in history you're kind of looking at the, at the narratives, there is the chaos as the jumble of stuff, and, but preceding that is chaos as, as actually a, an ordered void of nothingness. Um, so I, and in and, and Hesiod specifically, there is kind of, there is a, a um, there's sort of a creative arc that I interpret as sort of belonging to, to one form of chaos. And then it's sort of, he kind of starts over and, and creation starts again with a different story. It's very, it's, it's not unlike Genesis that way where it's like, it, where you, you can see some sort of uh, redos of, of how this narrative is going to go. Um, so I, I, did, I tried to capture or allude to that, that sort of uh, bifurcated, um, you know, what, what the void was mm -hmm. the uh, way here um, by having this, this uh, yeah, this very verbal, very, very empty, spare, um, you know, beginning, but then uh, also sort of then the, the next chapter, I, I hope reads as a follow up to to that one, yeah, but also can be read as just sort of a a, a new beginning in a, in its own because I because that's what I was seeing in in the myth there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, I, and I I hope later I, I I do try to allude to sort of the, the the chaos as chaos as as we think of chaos now, but I I wanted to I wanted to sort of. Uh, speak to both both depictions of the entity. Yeah, and in, on subsequent readings, I kind of put myself into the position of Hesiod. Is like when we see those words at the beginning, that is his. That's part of his like writing process. Yes, the and, the the terror of the blank page that yeah. we all know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then like compared to the end with the big fold out, that's when all the elements have kind of come together and they're singing and they flow. Mm. Not to jump ahead. Yeah, yeah, but that's a it's, it's a good it's a good opportunity to talk a little bit about Hesiod as the kind of like the, um, the your avatar in this because um, it sounds like that this is a book that you've spent a lot of time uh, working on crumbling up pages well not not literally crumbling up pages but throwing things out and then coming back to or changing and moving things around and so. One of the things that struck me in this narrative is that is uh, you know we're we're looking at we're we're reading a narrative that is 
kind of like you use the word bifurcated, which I think is really helpful. It's, it's set up so that we're seeing the creator coming up with the thing and the thing simultaneously. And I wanted to get your thoughts on just the, the, the creative process and the, the, the terror of the blank page and that sort of the, what you're kind of addressing um, in the, these, set of, um, these sets of pages. Yeah, so you know the, the 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 impetus of the whole project was creating a, a parallel between you know big C uh, creation and little C creation, um, and this was the part that was the hardest nut to crack. Mm -hmm. You've got you know I, I had the model of Hesiod's story. I've got you know the the uh, millennia of mythology to draw on uh, for you know the the mythological parts. Um, and really figuring out what I wanted to, to do with this. So the very first version of, of these, these interstitial bits was um, sort of a chorus of different, different creators, um, different, different types of uh, creation, different points in history, and so on. And sort of each panel, it would be you know, a dye maker, it would be you know, uh, a, a ceramicist, it would be a dancer, and so on. And, and they would be sort of monologuing, but the monologue would pass from you know one creator mm. to another, and so on. Which I thought was really brilliant until I re I tried to really structure it out, and it just it was heavy and it wasn't working. And so then that turned into a more standard narrative of Hesiod until it eventually became uh, this element. And yeah, as 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 you say, it it's uh, it's meant to be in parallel with with what's going on in the myths, but hopefully not too neatly in parallel. I don't want it to be you know the you know the end of the kids movie where you wake up and the fantasy is reflected in all the things right. in the child's room, sort of a thing. Um, but but hopefully, like it feels like you know that that it's not a, a total shifting gears from mm. whatever you were just reading reading before. Um, at least upon you know a little bit of uh, reflection, um, but yeah, it's it's just to to put a, a smaller face on on the great um, you know mythic movements uh, mm -hmm. of what's going on elsewhere. Yeah, I think your your point about uh, I do see in this book a uh, like progress. I think you're and you're intended to see progression in the way that. Um, in the way that Hesiod is like struggling and fighting with himself, and then you know as his as his brother, yes, mm -hmm. um, and the and just kind of like the <laughs> the struggle you see that struggle kind of reflected in the struggle of the gods, and you're also seeing um, that things get more refined the further along you go, as of course mythology has to, you know, as you continue to create new characters and you know who's going to be the god of crayfish or whatever. <laughs> um, and so, you know, but I think you, there is that, you know, you do get to see that kind of progression. And I'm, I'm thinking through this this book in a, in, a, in that sense, did, did it all, you know, it sounds like there were big swaths of it that you had to like take out and then put new in. Was this a, um, this, this doesn't seem like it was a front to back kind of process. It does feel like something that you've been uh, fiddling with, if you will. Yeah, the um, you know my my day job is is uh, teaching, and so I uh, there's you know chunks of the year where I'm real busy, and there's chunks of the year where I really get to focus on things. So this was a project that I would I would work on very very intensely, and then sort of step away from and come back to uh, the. The, the the myth I think did proceed pretty linearly. Um, I, I should also say you know what there was a stage at this where I got to uh, work with Paul Karasik um, really closely. Mm. Um, he uh, I got a grant for Paul to come to Penn State and uh, basically mentor me for for three months. That's wild. That's um, the man to do it. It was yeah yeah it was absolutely uh, a dream uh, to have happen. And um, I don't, th I don't know how much of what he was helping me with is actually in the final <laughs> book because it was just, um, uh, you know, because because things did come in and go out and so on. And uh, you know, I would, I would script these things out. I would, I would plot out the the whole book. But then at each at the next stage, I would always throw out whatever I had just scripted or mm. or what have you. So it was. 
I, I don't know. It's it was a, a, a messy and inefficient process. Uh, it was wildly unprofessional in terms of how to like actually take a piece to finish. But you know, I just I, I didn't know any other way to do it and feel like it would be you know a genuine live. Mm. Uh, experience, you know. That only seems appropriate for the story, too, right? Yeah, it, very much so. Yeah, I was, I definitely was, uh, um, I don't know, perhaps um, uh, invoking my future struggles by choosing this as my subject matter. Um, I'm kind of curious about how your training and uh, instincts as both entertainer and cartoonist but also academian uh, came to like play against each other in this book. Like, you know, you're taking this, you know, work of uh, ancient literature and like um, I see it played out not just in the cartooning, but especially in the dialogue where like Tartarus in particular is like this very funny character. I'm glad. And, and it's like, you know, Tartarus, the underworld, this kind of like this grim figure. And it's like he's just like wisecracking weirdo who's just hiding down in the dark. And, and how did, you know, you essentially did a book which, for the most part, it's funny. It's a comedy. But it's also about, you know, the pain of creation. Um, and just as, you know, it's it's about Hesiod's struggle with how to like get this thing to happen. It's also your little struggle with how to get it to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, in parallel with that, it's like it's it's you're the unseen hand, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and especially now doing this graphic novel, I've even done one for like a while, something this kind of long form. How did the that those twin aspects of your creative and intellectual career merge and? Conflict potentially in the process of it. Yeah, I think probably more con confliction than than merging uh, <laughs> occurring here, right? The the uh, you know part of of so you know I I love ideas and I love academia as a way of accessing really interesting ideas. Um, but when I'm making stuff, I, you know, I, I mentioned I can, I can get very sort of categorical about things, like about even styles of my own work. Um, but I find that really stultifying when it comes to actually making work. Mm. And uh, the, the thing that I really had to fight against here was the desire to be correct in my depiction of, of the, the myths and, mm. and of Hesiod and, and so on. That... Um, uh, I mean, that's, that's, for me at least, that's the death of creativity, worrying about someone pointing out that, oh, you kind of, you know, conflated mm. Eos, the goddess of dawn, with Aphrodite mm. here. Actually. And, exactly. Yeah, and, actually. and um, you know, I mean, you, you, can, you can drive yourself, or, or for that matter, like me feeling like, I've, I've got I've to show this split between the two conceptions of chaos. Like, I, I, if I'm doing that because it's fun and interesting for me and playing with the story, that's great. If I'm trying to serve some, some you know, uh, uh, you know, minutia, observant uh, critic uh, in, the, in the future, um, that's, that's just going to kill the, the impulse. Um, I did do some digging into, you know, some really interesting archaeology was happening with, with um, uncovering, like, some really early Greek temples uh, while I was working on this. So are these images, like, things that you saw? No, no, oh. <laughs> not at all. The, the visuals, I really sort of went, well, I, we can talk about that in a moment. But, like, uh, what, what those were fr actually freed me up because, of course, the archaeological record and the... You know, the, the, before Hesiod started writing this stuff down, and these were the, the oral tradition, there was such variety, and, and there was no canon, you know, yeah. to worry about. And, you know, there was this one temple of Aphrodite that was uncovered while I was, I was preparing to draw Aphrodite, um, that was uh, Aphrodite as a sea goddess depicted as a fish woman, a fish with some female characteristics. 
not at all the depiction of of Aphrodite, uh, you know, as as like you know the 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 embodiment of beauty or the embodiment of of love or the embodiment of cosmic you know uh, endeavor that that you know came much later. Um, but just no, just just she came out of the sea. She's a, she's a sea lady. She'll help us catch fish, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, just sort of that really helped free me up of like. How, whatever whatever liberties I take with the Greek myths, the Greeks took more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? I, 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 I've got permission to do this. Um, what was the point that I said we'd come back to? Oh, about um, the archaeology and if, well, if you looked at any the of those form. images and how, I'm, I'm curious about the influence of like your character design here. Yeah, so I I really was did not look at a lot of depictions of Greek mythology for this consciously. Um, I will say the, these uh, sort of primal titans that we're seeing up here now uh, are influenced sort of by my memories of like Cycladic sculpture mm. um, and, and Venus, Venus of Villendorf figures yeah. and, and yeah. that sort of thing. And, and that was definitely something I, I, was, I, I felt was appropriate to play with here. But you know, there's there's so many. Uh, you know, I, I, I Greek mythology was my first nerddom. You know, like before the Star Wars movies came out, before I saw comics, I I had books on Greek mythology, and I've I've been absorbing it my entire life. So there's a ton of stuff in the back of my brain, but I didn't want to just as I didn't want to like be beholden to academia. I didn't want to be beholden to art history either. So um, I really tried to create these characters as though I had never seen anything before. Um, I also really didn't want them to look too cool. I didn't want to like design um, you know, video game character sheets of like, you know, oh, this is going to be a really, a really awesome figure of uh, well, you know, after after I sort of finished this book, the the game Hades came out. Ah, yes. Had a beautiful game. Yes. Uh, beautiful character design in mm. it. Um, very much not what I wanted to do here. I wanted these guys to look a little awkward and a little too simplistic. What even. about the merch though? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yes. My my vast merchandising empire <laughs> is going to have to figure out its way around this one, but it just it it. Um, them looking awesome wasn't right for sort of the theme of the whole mm, story yeah. of sort of moving towards something. Yeah, I think that's interesting because as the generations happen in the book, like their um, their character models become more formed into something as mm -hmm. opposed to like yeah, just a shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and the the sort of the middle period uh, of the 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 young Titan. They were sort of the trickiest for me to figure out exactly what I wanted wanted them to look like. Of like, just how formed should they be? Do they look like people yet, or or not? And if they look too much like people, then do I have to go hyper realistic when Aphrodite finally shows up? And eh, I ended up not worrying too much about that. But but definitely with them, like they are they are particularly the figures I, I think of when I think like I wanted there to be a simplicity and an awkwardness to their design. So mm -hmm. like you know, one guy just has has spears for arms, just a bound bundle yeah. of spears for arms. It's a really dumb design that <laughs> makes no sense, but it struck me as emotionally right for mm. kind of where it was in the book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that part even visually, it's like hard to really, um, yeah, it's hard to like make sense of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. I think, yeah, and the Titans too, that's, um, to go back to the, the humor of the book, like them as these like playful kind of kids. It's like, that's something I thought really worked well. I'm glad, I, I, I'm, and I'm delighted to hear you guys say it's a funny book because I, I, never, uh, I never try to be funny. I'm not trying to like set up jokes or anything like that. But I also, I really can't take myself seriously. And when you spend hours at the page, I can't help but sort of like, sort of take the mick out of myself, mm. um, you know, on the page. And so I, I hope that comes through. I tend to think like I, I achieve quirkiness more than like actual humor. But, but I'm, I'm delighted when, when it might sort of surpass my expectations and become actively uh, funny. 
I think it, you know, it speaks to the, I guess, it, uh, to a certain degree, it speaks to the creative process too, right? Like you, you know, you, if you're not laughing, you're crying, you know, it's mm -hmm. like you're, you're you, at, at a certain point in the creative process, you're like, oh my God, if this thing never gets finished, I'm going to like rip <laughs> all my hair out, you yeah. know? Um, and I think that there, you know, there's, you, you kind of see that in Hesiod and, and the way that this whole process continues as the, as the comic progresses. I really love this page in particular and the way that like you're kind of, you know, uh, satirically addressing, you know, the majesty of the creative process. But what you're really doing is like, you know, it makes it everything, when I think about creation, I think about Linda Berry. Mm -hmm. And I think about what she describes as the two questions. And that when we're young, we don't think about creating. We don't think about drawing. We don't think about sculpting or dancing or playing. We just do it. It's like, it's the thing to do. And at the point when we start thinking about, we refer to as the two questions, is this good? Does this suck? Is when everything that was went into like the good parts of creation gets sucked away because here, when admiration, honor, and coin are the things you're concentrating on, there is no creation. It's yeah. impossible. And then this, she says that you have to kind of trick yourself to get back to the, the drawing board and actually do it again. And this is like, it's such a beautiful encapsulation of it's like when you're able to do that, when like you're able to get away from the two questions and the only thing that is important is just, you're almost like the vessel of creation. It's mm -hmm. not even like you who's doing yeah. it. How, how was it like, and so that's beautiful on this page, was this a similar experience for you as a creator in this book? Yeah, well, Linda Berry has part-time residency in my head, right? Mm. She's, uh, <laughs> you know, very, very influential. And, and yeah, I mean, that, that is the crux of sort of the, the point about creativity that I'm trying to make here is that, that um, you... You, 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 you can't really have the end goal in mind so much. You can't know, to, you know precisely where you're going in the process. You might, you might have objectives that guide whether or not you're on the right path or the wrong path. Mm -hmm. But, um, but that, those objectives aren't the same as having a blueprint of what the finish is mm -hmm. going to be, right? And the only way you get to the finish is by... So as, as a child, you make wonderful things because you are unfiltered and you just produce something and you don't really care if it's good or bad. You just did a thing and if it's not good, I mean, you're, you're, well, now you're doing a different thing, right. right? And as adults, we cannot engage in creativity that same way, or at least you know, not, not with the, the, a degree of reliability that it will allow us to stay clothed and fed. Um, <laughs> but so, so we need, we need a different process to achieve that same end. And, and that process is to, uh, uh, well, like what, what Anne Lamont describes as the shitty first draft, right? You just, you have to be able to generate and generate and generate, uh, without, you know, engaging judgment. Um, you, which in the, the language of my book is, you know, you, you've got to be Guy, the, the generative impulse producing monsters, um, but you, you, have, you can't at the same time be Oranos coming down and stomping on the monsters. Mm. You, you later, you, after the generative impulse is, is occurred, you then have, have, you know, sort of these, these decisive moments, Kronos with the knife, like, you know, uh, separating uh, which ideas uh, stay and, and which ideas don't, and, and having sort of a grand reserve of failed ideas to draw on to sort of for the new ideas to blossom out of, which mm. is, you know, Pontos in the ocean uh, with, you know, having, having absorbed all of the, uh, the, the rejected drafts of creation mm. there. I think it, 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 you're, you're getting at some of the thematic stuff that we were alluding to briefly at the start, and I think that's really, it's, I, that's a, to me, that's a positive thing. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the um, Oranos and, and Guy kind of that, that the push and pull there that exists in the middle part of the book where there is this, um, there's generation, a creation into sadness, right? And mm -hmm. also, um, um, 
I guess, editing into into oblivion. And I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts about what was what you were really trying to capture in that in that section of the book. Yeah, well, I think that that is exactly it. The notion that there are these two impulses, they are both necessary. You know, you, you cannot create anything reliably good without having both, but you have to, they, they have to be in the right relationship. Uh, it's very easy for them to, to be counterproductive, to destroy each other. And, and in the first section of, in, in the, the section where, you know, Guy is producing the monsters and so on, uh, they are they're in a destructive relationship. Mm. She's generating without reflection, just producing, you know, uh, horrors, and and he's coming and sort of judging, but without any sort of uh, uh, vision or 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 guidance about that. Um, and so there has to be something there that mediates, you mm. know, between the two. And that's then the the last half of the book is sort of how do you how do you um, bridge these two absolutely necessary but potentially contrary forces mm. um, in order to actually get to the point of, of a refined, you know, uh, creation. Mm. Thomas, I'm wondering, um, I, I think uh, Rob and I were very taken with this book, and I remember Rob telling me that you thought it was good, but it wasn't your thing. And so I'm, I'm kind of interested to hear more of your thoughts about what um, what what you're looking at and what you're seeing when you're looking at this book and why it may not have been your thing. I guess I appreciate the book and like the level of craft is there and it works, but I don't know, just something about this didn't resonate with me like personally. I think maybe it's just the Greek myth thing. It's just maybe um, not an impulse that I'm interested in artistically. Um, yeah, that, that's... That's hmm. kind of it. <laughs> you know, I think it. it, it I think it, it. It speaks to that idea of creativity as like it's not going to every. It's not going to be everybody's soup and nuts, right? Like you, you're going to make things that people are going to either love or hate or be indifferent to. Um, but to a certain degree, you just have to do it. You know, if it's in, if it's stuck in your head, you just gotta. You gotta make it happen, right? And I think, um, the. I think that's the thing that to me is. You know, you, you spoke to the uh, the toxic relationship between Guy and Oranos, and I think that that strikes me as like, if you lean either way too far, you'll you'll serve one you'll serve one god without serving another, mm -hmm. right? And so you will you'll, you'll end up in the worst of all these worlds where you're you're not making anything, right? Um, rather than rather than making something that you're either maybe you're not happy with, but you, at least it's on the page, or at least it's in the, it's in some sort of uh, final form. Um, it is about three. We've got we've got a little more time. Um, I'd be happy to open up the audience for some uh, for any questions that might come from the audience. So and now there, we can. And if there are you mics go, on either side yeah, of the room. If you could go to either of the sides of the room, if you have a question, be happy to. That way we can capture the audio for all the folks that are watching at home. On the uh, point of making something that that you know may or may not appeal to anyone outside of yourself, right? Yeah. The, the the question that I've I, you know um, publishers and agents and so on always ask is you know well, who, who's the market for this? Mm. Who do you intend this for? And I've never had an answer for that other than you know a fictional me that that didn't just draw this thing, right? <laughs> I, I I don't know. No no no. no. Ten thousand versions. Well, yes, yeah, yeah. correct. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, although that's a horrifying thought. <laughs> they're, um, all, they're all with Tartarus. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, so I, I, you know, I, I had long experience in in uh, you know uh, illustration and graphic design, where you think a lot about audience, and and for many pieces in a certain modality, I can do that, but. When I'm making a graphic novel, I really don't know how to do anything other than tell the story that that I would want to read. And um, uh, 
I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I, I, if there were another 10,000 of me out there, I would, I'd have a different career, perhaps. But, perhaps. Uh, yeah. Well, and that really comes through in the fold-out you showed. And, like, it's cool. But, like, when you showed me the first time, I just saw this look of delight on your face. <laughs> like, this makes me so happy. Like, nothing else matters. Because look at this thing mm -hmm. and how perfectly it dovetails into, you know, the way the tale is being told and exactly how I want it. You know, it's, it's, there's a satisfaction in that uh, that I could see not only when I saw you, but also in the book itself, that um, you go through kind of, you know, especially with, with Hesiod, the poet, and you, the artist, you know, they, they take you on this journey and um, through vanity and greed and all the wrong reasons to do something until it like, they're forced to like, you know, that, again, it falls away until they reach that, you know, wonderful point. And um, uh, I'm struck again by the story of like this, this idea came to you, this moment of inspiration. You know, how often has that like been a thing that's, you know, you, you talk about your, the Onion Jack thing, it's like, oh shit, I gotta do this over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And like, you found a way to do it. And this is almost the opposite where it's like, you hadn't done anything like this in years. And then it's just the flash of inspiration. Um, I often think about like, you know, it's the stupidest question of all any critic could ask. Where, where, where you got your ideas? <laughs> but it's it's literally like you just told us like two different examples of that. Yeah. And um, I also kind of think, how is this going to affect you in further projects now that you're kind of like you know, ten years has rolled around. You know, you're right. You're obligatory graphic novelist here, and yes, the twenty thirties are are coming up fast. Yeah, <laughs> they are. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, I mean, gosh, ideas are never the problem, right? I've, I, I have, uh, you know, 12 flashes of inspiration a day, uh, and it's also not a problem to have a one that where you think, oh, yeah, no, I think that could be a book. Uh, what happens to me a lot is I will have the flash of inspiration, I will decide that should be a book, and then I realize I'm not actually the person to make this book. Mm -hmm. um, and... Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if that's a common experience well, for well, other creators. How do you make I'm, that? How how do you discern that? How do you make that judgment? Why not you? Is it, is it, is it like a skill set you don't possess? Some sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's just you know it's it's very easy to to have an yeah it's to to the difference between sort of having the idea for a thing and then really loving every part about it, loving the process of, of enacting that idea mm. uh, is different. And so, so, you know, sometimes I will have ideas that I think would be a really great project in someone else's hands, but I know that, that I, I can't, I won't be in love with it three years from now on, on my 12th it's, draft. It's funny you use that word because it seems like you're describing a difference between like flirtation and a marriage. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. 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 I think that's that's very interesting because I think that kind of like leads back to the conversation about how do you decide what to make and the the whole creative process, right? And like, who are you, you know, the whole idea of the market, like who are you making this for? If you're not making it for yourself, who are you making it for, right? Well, this is, this is in my younger days, I, I knew exactly why I was making comics. I was making comics because I'm, I'm in my heart a very lonely person. And I needed to, it was the only way I felt like I could primarily share my internal experience mm. with others. Uh, then I met a wonderful person and I got married and I didn't have that like, that, that uh, soul loneliness anymore. Damn it. I really <laughs> screwed up my work for years. <laughs> Um, I'm much to your much to your benefit, I'm sure. <laughs> right. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, but but it has been. I don't I don't have like the clear log line for why I make these. I mean, it's, I think that's why I, I it is like a book a decade now because um, I, I I don't I'm not screaming into the wind, uh, you know, via via ink and paper anymore. Um, but there's there's. 
I don't know. I, to, to sound very kind of primo levi about it, there's there's a joy in the work, right? Mm-hmm. In in doing a thing and doing it well, um, of of trying to do something that you're not sure if you can do with it. Um, that is, it's not as dramatic as as the the. Uh, the soul loneliness of my 20s, right? Uh, but I, it's, I think it might be more sustaining in the long term. Yeah. I think that's a great place to wrap up. And Thomas, well, any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, there's actually one aspect of the book we didn't get to. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, when we see Hesiod and the, the shepherd. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, that was interesting to me because you see those two different kind of labors happening. Like you see, mm-hmm. he's yeah, doing the mental labor, and you see the um, the shepherd doing the farming and the sustenance. And mm-hmm. so you have that kind of physical and like philosophical, emotional, um, like a, that need for both sides of the humanity happening at the same time in this this like um, at this point of, of human development. So. Yeah, so uh, obviously, I think in, in the story, obviously, I think it's, it's always helpful to have a contrast, right? And so if, I, if I'm sort of trying to both um, uh, display but also kind of take the air out of Hesiod's labors, you know, on this thing, it's, it's helpful to have a contrasting figure. There's also kind of a historical reference there of Hesiod, like Homer, may or may not have been an individual, may have been a school of, of poets. And uh, there may have been a historical uh, Hesiod. There may also have been a brother of Hesiod who may have done some, some of the writing, and then all these other people. And before Theogony, Hesiod wrote Works and Days, which is really about, like, well, this is you know, about the labor in the earth, you know, about people's quotidian, it's, you know, very thematically different than let's talk about the gods and and what they're up to. Uh, So, you know, there was a sort of an allusion to that, but primarily what it probably comes down to is my older brother's a carpenter and I'm a cartoonist. And sometimes I I feel like, you know, just, uh, you know, I I feel, uh, well, the contrast. I'm very. I'm keenly aware of the contrast in sort of the 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 um, uh, the, the concrete nature of our of his endeavor compared yeah. to sort of the 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 airiness of mine. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. You're right. It is good to have a foil, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rob, any final final thoughts? I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I did as well. Joel, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. And thank you all of you for attending our panel presentation. It doesn't look like we've got any questions, um, but we'd be happy to step outside of the hall and, as the previous uh, panel said, take it outside. Um, Thank you all so much for attending, and thanks for uh, coming to SPX. This has been Soul Radio and a conversation with Joel Pretty about his new book, First There Was Chaos. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That was great.